Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. It's an interpretive art and it's connected to writing and directing. And the more holistic view you can have of it, it will help you. But more essential to that is most of us are only as good as our opportunities. And when the opportunities aren't there, you have to search for ways to articulate your love. Welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, a very special episode, I will say, of In the Envelope, because this is our 150th episode, number 150. I believe that means we can call it a sesquicentennial episode. Maybe that just applies to like anniversaries. It's a sesquicentennial anniversary episode of In the Envelope. Um, and I can't think of a better guest to feature than Ethan Hawke, whose voice you just heard. What a prolific and inspiring artist to learn from, so thoughtful and so profound, as you'll hear in this interview. He's, of course, known for everything from his early days in the Dead Poet Society to his many collaborations with Richard Linklater, which are so such groundbreaking indie film work, the Before Trilogy with Julie Delpy, um, and of course, Boyhood, one of my favorite films. Um, I remember studying his 2000 film version of Hamlet in college. So it was a full circle moment for me to speak to Ethan, to speak about his process, how holistically he views it all, his sort of philosophical approach to producing honest work. I mean, he still talks about it in a way that I think is really actionable for listeners, uh, whether that's acting or writing. And look, listeners, it's more and more an emerging theme on this podcast. I would say, especially recently, like, We are past actors, you need to write your own material. The era we are in is that everyone is a multi-hyphenate. Everyone should become an Ethan Hawke. Everyone has, you know, storytelling resources at their fingertips and can immerse themselves in a variety of art forms, diversity of stories and storytellers and all of that, all that good stuff that is, you know, the key to success in this wild industry that we call the biz. Um, Speaking of which, check out this week's print issue of Backstage, which is a deep dive on the state of performance education. It features a ton of interviews with professors and acting program directors on the kind of cultural climate of 2021, the past year of COVID-19, and how that has affected students. Stick around after this interview to hear, as always, from Christine, our Backstage Casting Insider, because she gives the latest, I mean the super up-to-date latest, on Broadway's reopening among other things. So I will stop talking now and let's take a quick break and then get to this wonderful, wonderful interview with Ethan Hawke. Ethan, if you're listening, thank you so much for joining us. The voiceover business is more than just acting. It's a business. Voice actors are auditioning, negotiating, engineering, branding, connecting to sessions from home and doing thousands of things every day to put them in the best position to succeed. So how do you learn about the business of the voiceover business? That part is easy. The Vocation Conference Online, eVocation. June 11th through the 13th, join experts in the voiceover industry for classes, talks, panels, and forums on the business of the business. For more information and tickets, visit vocationconference.com. Actor, writer, director, and all-around storyteller Ethan Hawke has produced intensely honest work in everything from his breakouts in Explorers and Dead Poets Society to recently First Reformed, Blaze, and Tesla. 
one of the few artists to ever be Oscar nominated for both acting for Training Day and Boyhood, and writing for Before Sunset and Before Midnight with longtime collaborator Richard Linklater, Ethan is also a Tony nominated New York theater veteran, as well as an activist, advocate, and philanthropist. He was SAG Award nominated this year as John Brown on Showtime's limited series The Good Lord Bird. Here is the wonderful Ethan Hawke. There's so much to discuss. Thank you so much for taking the time. Are you doing a bunch of are a bunch of press these days? A little bit. You know, um, the big bulk of all my press work on this is, is over. So this is just the mm. the fun victory lap kind of press. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations on all the success of Good Lord Bird. It's a very well deserved success. It's such a great show. And I'm sure you love talking about it, right? I do actually. <laughs> I love talking about it. You know, we we worked so hard on this for so long and yeah. there's something about the the piece that feels strangely relevant to this moment and it's it's been really fun to engage in conversation about it just because you know john brown is such a fascinating character and there's a lot to say about it. i i had a lot of trouble letting go of this character i, I found him so unendingly interesting oh cool we actually love hearing about that like the process of letting go like it was it was it just emotional like you didn't want to say goodbye well, it's an interesting question, but I think for people who love acting, we often do a tremendous amount of work inviting characters into our imagination. Mm. We expend ridiculous amounts of energy trying to be more believable as a certain character and what do they have in their pockets and what do they dream about and what's their favorite color and trying to make these characters vivid for people but we don't have much teaching or knowledge about how to let go, yes. you know, and how to let these, these feelings pass through you and not stay trapped in you and, mm. and make them of service to your larger life. So sometimes the, the better the character, the more rich and multi-dimensional the character or the opportunity or the experience, sometimes they, they can be, I sometimes wish we had a process of, you know, taking the wardrobe and burning it or going on, camping trip with <laughs> your family or something, getting back sure. into your own life and inviting your own imagination back in. Mm. And with the character, there's a lot been written about John Brown. And also, look, it was, you know, the limited series is new for me. So it mm. felt a little bit like doing three independent movies back to back playing the yeah. same character. It was a huge psychic task. Mm. And then as soon as I finished, there was a national pandemic. So it wasn't like, oh. well, Normally, I think one of the things that helps me let go of a character is getting another job. You kind of begin the process of, well, all right, I got to play somebody else now. But when hmm. you're not really doing much acting, the character lingers around. I see. Yeah, that answers the question beautifully because I was going to ask, like, do you sometimes have to let go of characters by just replacing them with a new project and a new process? And of course, there are times when you've had lulls in your career, right, where maybe those characters have to linger. Yeah, and you know, normally, if you do a, a theater production, it, it's a little bit more taxing because you know you could, you know, for example, take a movie like First Reform. That's a very complex yes. character mm. and a really interesting human being to try to inhabit their skin. But mm. I only had to do it for five weeks. You know, yeah. I, I I ran Hurley Burley nine months or something. So the character is just the yeah. words are vibrating around the behavior is in your body and. And this experience was some kind of cross between theater and film in a strange way for me because oh. it was, you know, we shot for six months. I, I, I was in preparation for it for a couple of years. So hmm. it wasn't just another part for me. You know, it, it felt like it felt like it took a lifetime to be ready for a part as challenging as this. And so wow. I didn't want to let it go. You know, hmm. that's that's the truth. The truth is I liked him. I enjoyed being around him. I, I wish that you know, you find yourself thinking, what would John Brown say to this moment? Or You can't have a season two also, so you can't wish for more, I guess. Yeah. That's so interesting because as an audience member, I guess theater is a different story. Yeah, but seeing your projects, it, we don't, we're not really thinking about how much time has gone into each role, which for you is a completely different amount of time each time. But for us, it's like, I mean, first reform, that sounds so intense. But if it was only five weeks... I just watched First Reform for the first time last night, and I have to say, honestly, it, it f***ed me up, I think. I think it's designed to do that. 
Yeah, yeah. But also, we're maybe kind of also gave me hope. I have so many questions for you. Of course, we are backstage this podcast. You are you are familiar with backstage, of course. Yeah, of course. And you love uh, giving advice to early career actors and artists and supporting supporting the arts. Well, I do. I love acting, you know, and so it's, it's yeah. my life has been dedicated to it. And so I don't know that I'm really in the advice business, but I, I <laughs> like having a I like conversations about what we yeah. do. And I hope that somehow it could be of use to somebody. Yeah. So I, of course, want to ask about process as an actor, but these days, especially with these podcast interviews, maybe in the last year of the pandemic or so, the role of just actor and just writer, those things are becoming increasingly blended. Would you agree? So any early career advice for actors, do you tend to also include like the advice of creating your own stuff and writing your own material? Well, I think it's, I think it's important. You know, there's an old shaker expression, which is if you want to master a craft, you have to apprentice three. I think part of dedicating your life to acting is it's an interpretive art and it's connected to writing and directing. And the more holistic view you can have of it, it will help you. But more essential to that is most of us are only as good as our opportunities. And when the opportunities aren't there, you have to search for ways to articulate your love, you know, to mm -hmm. ar ar articulate, to find a way to make your imagination manifest. You know, I always laugh, you know, some actor gets a huge award for oh, you know, take somebody who's brilliant like Daniel Day-Lewis and, you know, he's in Gangs of New York and he's utterly brilliant in that movie. I mean, it's one of my favorite performances, mm -hmm. but he's got Martin Scorsese. He's got some of the best writers in the history of the world working on a sure. script. He's got the best DP in the world. I mean, that's a great opportunity, right? Most <laughs> of us act, you know, you, you watch some, you know, the guest star on Matlock, the second lead on MacGyver. That's where the real genius, if you can be good on Mac MacGyver, yes. you deserve a prize, you know? And, and so I, I feel that it's important that we as performers work on yourself and your own creativity so that when a great opportunity arises, yeah. your mind is ready. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's a very dangerous profession that way because sometimes the opportunities aren't there. And so our, our right our life's journey as actors is being ready for when they come. Yeah, does being and does being ready involve kind of imitating the structures of like, well, let's pretend I'm working with the crew of Gangs of New York and create something that psychs me up for that. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I mean, there's a lot of ways. I remember when I was younger, I used to, when I was out of work, I used to, you know, I just pick one, Shakespeare speech, something famous, okay. something like that. And I would make my, you know, now we have cell phones and everything it doesn't really, but I used to have this dictaphone. Uh -huh. And I'd take like, oh, the we few, we happy few speech or from Henry V or something like that. And I'd take it and I'd just make myself spend a couple hours reciting it. And you do notice over a period of a couple of days, you get a lot better at it. You get a yeah. more knowledgeable at it. Now, obviously, the better idea would be to go to the Royal Shakespeare Company or something, but I didn't have that opportunity. Right. So I would say, and that's just a small way that you can just work in your brain and work on your ability. The other thing you can do is try to write and write mm. short stories and write whatever you feel like writing because most of what we do is celebrating writing and understanding the task of writing. Mm. Sentence structure, word choice. Why did a writer pick that word? Why does you know, pick your favorite writer. Why did they, why that word? Or Yeah. Um, I find that we live in a great opportunity, a great moment for that, because it's super easy to record yourself trying to work on things. You also can go online and watch Ian McKellen do the speech. Yeah. There's so many ways to fill your brain and make sure, you know, I think a lot of actors can make the mistake that like, especially young people can make the mistake that going to the gym is like working on their acting. And in a certain way, the body's, mm. your body's your instrument and everything like that. That's all true and being in touch with your body is, is a great thing. But it doesn't replace figuring out how the body and mind connect and how you can make those kind of connections and, and having an aptitude for language, which is a big mm. part of our job, only comes from experience. Yeah. And you don't need great opportunities to have experience with okay. great writers. 
You can pick your favorite, August Wilson, John Leguizamo, learn a John Leguizamo piece, learn a, <laughs> um, take a Beckett piece, make yourself learn it. Yeah. Figure out why it's interesting. I find that that helps my brain stay awake. Sure. I also think watching movies is a great, great tool. Definitely. Like, you know, you see Denzel Washington movie, you love him, go watch all his movies. You know, go watch them all. It's, I love to do that. You know, if you geek out and let yourself watch every Paul Newman movie, you mm -hmm. actually learn a lot. You're like, oh, he does that a lot. Why does he do that? Oh, wow, look how simple he is with his body. Wow, that's really effective in that performance. It's less effective in that one. It's also fun to watch great performers be terrible because it, oh. I love that because I always feel like every time I suck <laughs> that I must then be a bad actor. Like sure. if I was a good actor, I wouldn't have sucked. And you're like, no, actually, there's a lot of good actors that have given terrible performances. So you yeah. kind of, you give yourself permission to learn. Does that make sense? Absolutely, that's beautiful. It's really worth reminding. And of course, on this podcast, we love hearing about the failures and the mistakes just as much as the successes. And you're well, saying, follow your favorites. No one's perfect. Of course, and the truth of the matter is, failure is our greatest teacher. Success uh -huh. mostly just teaches you how to be an so um, <laughs> failure is where the money lives, you know? Yeah. What have you watched recently? It's like, I, it's, uh, you've, your inspirations must have changed so much over the course of your career. Has the pandemic or like what has been inspiring you in the last year when things have, of course, slowed down? Well, to be honest, I've been spending the pandemic making a documentary about Paul Newman and Joanne Wood Woodward. Yeah. And so I've been studying their movies and that's been really fun and, and enriching and, and um, Great. But like, I don't know, I, I, I watched the other day for the first time, My Own Private Idaho. And mm. God, I was blown away. That movie is so radical. For people who haven't seen it, River Phoenix is as good as James Dean ever dreamed of being in that movie. And it's still, I mean, that movie's what, 30 years old or something? It's It's got a punk rock vibe. If that movie came out today, it would be edgy. Oh, cool. I mean, it is wild and it's a, uh, it's really adventure film. And you feel the actors and the director in sync. They're on the search for something. They're not trying to entertain mm. you. They're not trying to win prizes. They're not trying to, they're hunting for something original mm. to express themselves. And when you feel that coming off the screen, yeah. there's, a, there's a hunger happening there that is very rare and, and thrilling to see. Yeah. I've been thinking about that so much, this idea of, of questions rather than answers. I think, I feel like we as a culture, maybe something about internet culture, we are we are craving art that is black and white answers, that is that doesn't leave a lot of room for impressionistic nuance. And again, First Reformed, the ending of First Reformed is is beyond words, what, what that is yeah. expressing. There's something universal that cannot be expressed. Yeah, I mean, that movie ends with a giant question mark. I mean, that's, yes. you're spot on about that. And I do feel we're living in a time period where it's just, everybody's about dualistic thinking. It's either this or that. Yes. You, you know, and it, it's really just not the truth. You yeah. can't just decide that these people are morons and these ones are geniuses or the inverse. It's life moves. I mean, you know, it's not, you don't need it from me, but it's all, it's, it's circular. Everything is always circular and shades of gray. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when you, when you start thinking in that binary way, you kind of rob life of all of its mystery. You know, I always think those Chekhov plays are so brilliant because mm. they're both so, they're full of all this agony and pain and sadness, and they're all so silly and goofy, yeah. and people are full of eccentric foibles, and nobody's one thing. You can't tell if it's masculine or feminine. He writes such great female characters, Ooh, great yeah. male characters, and it's so exciting when it's not one thing, you know? Yeah. And you feel a lot, of, a lot of the artists today are making things that are super black and white. You know, everything yeah. feels like it has an agenda or preaching to its choir. Yes. I mean, one of the things that I loved about John Brown at, when I did A Good Lord Bird is just that character f people up because he's, he's so <laughs> beautiful and he's so wise in so many ways. And he's also a murderer. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's so complex. Yeah, uh, it, it, the the dynamics that are running around inside that person are are so rich and so rich with nuance and uh, yeah. 
And, you know, there's people who want to say he's crazy. There's people who want to say he's a saint. They want to Absolutely. Say, you know, I mean. Totally right or totally wrong. Yeah. He's a human being, you yeah. know, and that's what we all are. You know, Paul Schrader, in regards to First Reformed, Formed often talks about that as, what is the nature of forgiveness in our community for each other, for our friends? Where do we, if we don't have an air of forgiveness, then we all kind of go off to our corners and, and nobody learns anything from anybody yeah. else. Um, it's no collaboration. Yeah. And so, I don't know, I think that's part of, part of the value of the artistic community, what our job is. Our job mm. is to ask these questions that force people out of their binary way of thinking. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, so. Is that a pretty central tenet to your, I guess speaking, this is specifically about the acting, because then John Brown might be the perfect example. Are you then approaching that with, I would like to indulge in this nuance like don't you as an actor have to make firm decisions some of some of your creating of the character does have to be black and white right you have to have a firm handle on point of view but that doesn't okay. mean the art itself has to uh, you know like oh i don't know i just I'm th you know just mentioning the play hurley burley mm -hmm. those characters are misogynistic the play is not there, there's okay. a difference do you, you know like the care the actor's job is to fully explore this kind of hateful misogynistic drug addled person at its all in if the actor is judging that person saying right. i'm saying these hateful lines but just so you know audience i don't mean it yeah it doesn't work you have to trust that by putting it on stage the audience has a brain sure and and you've got to believe in it a thousand percent and then they'll see misogyny but instead, if you create characters where, and he, here's the point is that you find that these misogynists also have likable traits. That's what breaks our brain. Wait, yes. I thought he was the bad guy. You know, it's like uh, James hmm. McBride gave me this advice when we were casting the good Lord Bird, because it, it deals with all the sensitive issues of race. And I had some really racist characters. And McBride called me up one day and said, make sure when you have a racist character, cast someone you love. Cast sure. someone you really respect and you really like them. Because if the white people in the movie have horns, then the, the pain and suffering caused by their actions isn't real either. Yeah, there's a distance. And, yeah. and, and it's, these are, this is, yeah, he's a racist pig, this character, but he yeah. loves his mom. He takes good care of his dogs. He's a really great brother. And you know, he's a pretty decent son. You're like, wait, wait, I thought you said he was a racist pig. Like, yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> He's all those things. Yeah. And that's when you find, you know, a great example is De Niro and Pesci and Raging Bull, right? You would never say that they're like great guys, those characters. No, right. But but they're by those two actors fully committing themselves yeah. to those roles, they become human beings. And then you can learn from the human being. They don't, you don't have to judge them. Yeah. Yeah, judging a, a, an actor judging their character also um, that wink to the audience, that's also an ego, right? Like the ego gets in the way. Yeah. And you know, I have to say one of the things about turning 50 is I'm allowed to say things like that. Sure. I see, that, I see this in, in young people's performances a lot now is mm. there was, a, when I was first arriving in New York, oh, it, there was still the echoes of Actors Studio and Kazan and this search to be inside people and just love people for being human. And recently there's kind of a, a glib, kind of ironic thing happening to performances where yeah. actors are both in their character and not, they're also posing a little bit and we're supposed yeah. to like that. And I'm not saying some of the work isn't funny or interesting or, but it, it lacks a level of commitment that you see from oh, Pacino and Dog Day Afternoon or Denzel and Malcolm X or, you know, they're just all in. There's no winking going on. Yeah. There's a tendency towards irony these days and away yeah, from like yeah. earnestness. Which, which just, it's, it's like a way of making yourself safe. It's, you know, it's yes. not really me. I, 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 you know, yeah. and it, it does come from social media too. Everybody has a presence online. And yes. you're, you, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I didn't know anything at all about who Robert Redford was as a person. I just knew him as the characters and they, gotcha. You didn't watch him on Oprah 29 times, you know? Right, right. 
Yeah, you're not also in your head holding some other persona of his, some more true persona. Yeah, exactly, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. In true in quotes, we don't even know if that's true. It's just some impression oh, yeah. you made when they were on the Jay Leno show or something. Yes, or on Instagram. Or on Instagram, exactly. Yeah, these Leno layers Leno. of identity. But like, in, so an actor's job you're saying is to commit for sure. But this idea of like knowing when your character, I love the this idea of the misogynistic character knowing when your character is at odds from the overall story, that's where it comes back to like an actor needs to be familiar with the facility of language and read great writing and maybe even think like a writer. I think the best ones do. I remember reading an interview with Al Pacino once where he said he knows he's doing well when he feels himself inside the metaphor of the play. Like when you're kind of a part of the river and when it's all about you, when you think you're doing a great job or you think you did this beautiful thing, it's a 99% chance it's not beautiful, it's self-conscious. And right. when you lose yourself, you know, it's like in sports, you know, when, when the player loses themselves to the game, you can know they're playing well because you're sure. just in the game. Um, and that's what we aspire to be. It's just inside the poem. Yeah. It takes, it takes bravery, right? Like at the early career, it takes bravery to be vulnerable and that selfless, almost, like giving your way, giving yourself up to... It's been said on this podcast before that, do you think of yourself as a vessel? Gosh, I wonder. I mean, <laughs> you don't want to underestimate your position. You, you, are, you are a vessel mm. in ways to the larger themes. Like one of the things I love about doing great writing, like say you're playing Macbeth or something like that. Sure. You're never going to play that part as well as it deserves to be played. You are, That's a great, yeah. You're trying, you are making yourself, you're, you're trying to join your spirit energy to this larger energy that's at work of the play. And in that way, you're a vessel. One of the things I don't like about the word vessel sometimes is, mm. is an idea of um, non-agency, that you're not, you're also a player. You know, you're not just floating. You're not just, it's so confusing to try to talk about these things. You're not sure. just floating down the river. You're navigating the river. The best okay. people adjust with the river and they move yeah. with the river and they, they like, so yes, you are a vessel, but I also want like, you want to be a well-made vessel. How about that? Okay. A well-built one, ready for the steer. storms, ready for the white water, ready for the still part, you know? Yeah, yeah I love that. And so that's how you think of your, that's how you think of your acting. When you're writing, are you uh, designing the river? Are you, um, <laughs> how, do, how can we continue this metaphor? I don't know, you, you just made me think about, I was once in rehearsal for a Sam Shepard play. Mm -hmm. And he said, one of the things that he didn't like about being the playwright and coming to rehearsal is that everybody else in the room has this idea that you're the author of the play. And ah. if you're a smart author, you realize that you too are a vessel. And that okay. basically what he was doing as a playwright is asking you to seek the same muse that struck him. That there's, if a piece of writing is great, it's a little bit like a electricity in the air that the writer caught and it's flowing through him full of his or her intellect and his or her emotional experiences. And, and, and they are just kind of channeling this energy. Mm -hmm. And that your job of the actor is not to just do what the playwright or the director asks you to do. Your job is to channel that energy, that mm -hmm. energy that flew into the writer. And, and so in a lot of ways, I think the job of the writer is to poise themselves in such a way to facilitate Mm -hmm. that flow right I don't know I mean it's, it's an interesting I mean it's an interesting conversation to me I mean it's there again sure. to, our, to our point there are, I don't have any answers I don't know <laughs> I can just tell you what 30 years of experience feels like yeah at this point yeah I think the uh writing and directing and acting hat question can only go so far when you're at a point in your career where it's pretty instinctual right and you are it's not to say you're not learning every project but yeah but you know, Sanford Meisner has a great quote about, it takes about 20 years for a violinist not to be thinking about where their hand is mm. or where they're pressing the string. And in the same way for us, 
it takes a lot of experience to start letting your subconscious work. There's a lot of crap you have to work through to make, to let your instincts fly. Because your, mm. your instincts and your subconscious are so much, your gut is so much smarter than your brain. And just to get a lot of experience with a lot of different kinds of projects, writing, directing, I, film, I really, theater. I really believe in that. You just, it's fascinating. You know, like I've done a bunch of things with Julie Delpy and she loves mm -hmm. writing music and writing political essays and she loves photography and she loves acting and she loves directing. And so when you're acting with her, mm. there's a real presence there. I mean, she's, she's very present and all the tools at her fingertips are, she's aware of what might work for this shot. She's not self-conscious about it. She's instinctually aware of pace, movement, framing, cool. uh, vocal, volume, you know, all the different dynamics that are at play in a performance. She's aware of, she's cut films. She knows yeah. music of, of, of performance. That's stuff like rhythm is so hard to quantify. Like that is the kind of thing that you have to, it has to be instinctual. It has to be gut rather than brain, right? Yeah, you find it. I mean, like one of the great, uh, right before the pandemic, or I guess a year before the pandemic, um, Paul Dano and I were doing True West. Yes, I saw it. Oh, well, one of the things you learn in with the audience, hmm. it's something you don't totally learn until you're doing it, is the value of silence and that the mm -hmm. playwright is often using silence and that, you know, what's the first thing? So mom took off for Alaska, huh? And there's a beat before he goes, yeah. And that beat, mm -hmm. if it goes too quick, mom took off for Alaska, huh? Yeah, it's nothing. Right. Mom took off for Alaska, huh? Yeah, it's weirder. <laughs> and you start to yeah. hear you start to hear the fact that your performance lives in these silences. Cool. Now, if you overuse the pause, it's like anything else. It, it's like any, I remember I had this director once who said this great, great uh, note to me after a performance of, of a play. He said to me, you know the pause you take in act one, scene one, after she drops the pen? I'm like, yeah, he goes, such a great pause. It's like, oh, thanks. You know, in scene two, when, you're eating the banana and you take that pause before you eat it. I'm like, oh, it's great. Hey, you know that pause in scene three, like when you pick up the pen, you're about to sign it, you really think about it. It's great. And he went on and on, you know, <laughs> until he's finally said, that's a lot of great pauses. Yeah. You know? He said, right. pick, pick one. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, and that's where you're like, oh, right. That's the rhythm. I can't yes. over I can't overuse this tool or it has no meaning. Same yes. with shouting. Yes. Same with crying. Same with yeah. all the dynamics that are at play. With it, they're all valuable tools to have in your kit. Overuse yeah. it, even if you're funny, even if you're really funny, if you overuse that wit, you miss the ability to mine pathos. You, you yeah. it's like you have to be constantly aware of what the energy of a given scene really wants. Yeah, and the energy of the audience too. Like, I'd love to ask, like, are you thinking like Julie Delpy? Are you thinking, how do you think about the idea of staying present? I guess, especially on stage in front of an audience. I think being unpresent on stage or in front of the camera, it's, it's, that's the whole game. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, like think about Jack Nicholson at his best, Meryl Streep's the same way. They're so spontaneous. Yeah. You just feel you feel the spontaneity of thought happening and it's thrilling, you know, and it, it's strange, but it takes real work mm. to like know the environment so well yeah. that you can actually forget it all. Yeah. <laughs> Those people know the river really, really well. You know, the, they know when it's going to get fast and when it's going to get slow yeah. and their vessel is built very well to handle any water. We're working this metaphor. I love it. I know. It's, it's helpful for me to, to think about it because these this is very amorphous stuff. Do you have moments when you're not? Like, what do you then do when you're on set or on stage and you're not in the moment or you're in your head? Do you have, the, do you have moments of self-doubt, of just like hyper self-consciousness? Yeah, of course. And um, my go-to trick is to connect with my scene partner. Okay. You know, my, that's my go-to trick is, is like, when in doubt, go slow down. Yeah. Most of us have it 
instinctual thing. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to go fast. They won't mm -hmm. notice, you, you know, and, 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 and everything gets really messy, but in truth, like you can't play the piano fast until you can play it slow. Mm -hmm. And, and so you're best off to slow down and connect with people to really take them in, get your mind off yourself. Usually that's the big key. What's if you can start thinking about how to help your scene partner, how to connect with them, mm -hmm. how they're doing, how to help them do a better performance, how to be in sync with your environment. You know, mm -hmm. those kind of little physical tricks can really help you. So it is physical because that is again, like more gut than brain. It's about getting you out of your I mean, head. If it's right for the scene at all, I often find touching somebody really helps. You know, sometimes it's inappropriate for the scene, but yeah. sometimes, you know, eye contact, touching yeah. somebody, pausing for a second, just collect yourself, get that. out of your head. It's also, it's just really important to realize that the, the play, the movie, the song, whatever you're doing, it, it's not about you. If it's any good, it's got to be about something bigger than you. Yeah. So you've got to try to get in touch with that something bigger. Yeah. Just get in touch with some, some humility. Yeah, it's really least. true. Yeah. Is it also safe to say this, and this maybe brings it back to John Brown, there are certain roles that allow for more physicalized choices. I think of Absolutely. John Brown as like, Absolutely. I just watched, I just rewatched a scene where the, the scene partner you are touching and reaching out to touch is a horse. Mm -hmm. And I could see, I almost could see like that, that, talk about that spontaneity, like that's you being in the moment and instinctively wanting to ground yourself with something like, are you allowed that? Because John Brown is, I would call him wild. I mean, I'd be curious yeah, to know how wild, you describe he's him. He's a tactile person. That's yeah. a great thing to say what you just said, as far as illustrating our point. That scene I was really struggling with. And I had, this is like what actors can do, right? I had this subtext and things like, or I really felt that John Brown was connected to the natural world and sure. that he felt a lot of, people I've met in my life who are really, really, um, not in a phony way, but seriously religious, that, that their primary relationship is with their maker. These people that have a, a real awareness of their inner life and their spiritual life tend to really like nature. Yeah. You, you know, they, and I thought it was always my go-to move in that thing is to connect myself with a tree, connect myself with mm -hmm. a bug or a bunny and a squirrel, right? whatever it was. And I, I had, I was doing this scene with Wyatt Russell and his horse kept moving and it kept ruining the shot. And so I started petting the horse and then Wyatt, like a good actor, yes. had a response. He said, stop doing that. Yes. And he, and he did it in character and we both were in character, but now the scene is crackling. Yes, with okay. Wyatt wanted, he, he didn't think I was listening to him because I was concentrating on the horse, which bugged him. Yeah, And this is where that weird thing where it's the opposite of what I was just saying. It's because we were both not doing what the other one wanted the actor to do. It actually yes. made the scene happen. Yeah. So you don't need your scene partner to help you. They'll help you if they're in their own skin. And yes. why it, and that moment, you know, I was so pleased when the editor put that moment in because that okay. was just a little improv. And now we're talking about it now because yeah. sometimes in that kind of work, the character gets revealed. Wyatt's character is revealed by saying, stop touching my horse. My character, it, it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's those little behavioral nuances that lift the writing out of the page and into the world. Mm. I was wondering if that line was improvised. That's so great that it was. And you as a writer, this is like maybe going back to the ego thing. You as a writer aren't going, that wasn't in the script, right? Like that's in service to the story. Yeah, exactly. Like a good, I mean, it's, Fascinating, like, you know, take a great play like True West. If you go back and watch Malkovich and Sinise's videotape of that play, oh, they, cool. they filmed their theater production. Malkovich is doing so many things that are not in the script and he's electric. And Sam Shepard wasn't there saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Because Malkovich was in touch with the muse. You know, he was chasing sure. the same muse and so there's, a you know, there's a duality. It's like what we said before. It's not either one. or You have to be respectful of the writing and you have to be respectful of yourself yeah, and you cool. have to be respectful of the situation. And if the horse is moving and you don't respond to it, you look like a cheesy actor. 
And if your scene partner is too obsessed with the horse and not listening to you, tell him, sure. you know, <laughs> listen to me. Yeah. Fully, fully committed, fully in character. Yeah. That's the dream. That's the dream. I am. I have been more and more wary with the phrase in character, with the idea of being in character. Like, do you think of yourself? Do you think of actor and character separation or is it all you're just trying to immerse and like. My dream is always how to stop acting. Right. So the phrase right. in character is very useful for a young actor. But okay. at, a certain, at a certain point, it becomes not useful because yeah. it implies a time that you're out of character. And, and it's like, you hear actors say this all, I was in it, I was out of it. What do you know? <laughs> you know it, all I know is whenever you're thinking like that, you're definitely, you're outside looking in. Yeah. And like often in life, like even in this course, this interview, one minute I can be completely engaged and the next minute I could be noticing that my hair looks ridiculous on this Zoom or <laughs> uh, I wish the lighting was better or I'm thinking about what time is it? You, you, you know what I mean? Oh, and that doesn't mean I'm not engaged. I'm yeah. both in character and out of character the way. So yeah. you, have to, you have to loosen the reins in yourself a little bit mm. to let yourself inside the world and trust. You know, I, I think a lot of actors think their talent is a lot more fragile than it is. Usually, oh, like let's take Nina Simone, for example, or something. Nina, I have no idea. I've never met the woman. I don't know anything about her. But, but I know that she's an amazing artist. And she might say, oh, I was really in the pocket on that, oh. on that song. I was really out of it. I don't like my phrasing on that. But me as the fan, yeah, it's not that fragile. I love what she's doing. What she's doing is in the DNA of her whole being. And, and yeah, yeah, she's micromanaging her little beats because she has expectations about what yeah. she wants to accomplish. But me, the audience, that's, that's her problem. Love that. and, and, and so you can trust that what you're doing uh, has a greater value than your intellect. And so you don't need to be so judgmental of yourself. Hmm. And that's great life advice too. Just be compassionate to yourself. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, we, we all, we, I've really tried, we're trying to learn that this past year. Um, coming up next, I'm excited to see this Waiting for Godot, which by the time we release this podcast might be out. You, that was Zoom theater? You filmed it over Zoom? Kind of. It's, okay. it's really a weird project. Yeah. It started that we were going to do a Zoom reading of Waiting for Godot to raise money for the theater. But as we started rehearsing it, it was really good. I mean, we, I was doing it with Legazamo, um, Tariq Trotter, AKA Black Thought, you know, from The Roots and Wallace Shawn. And we were doing this and there's something about the alienation that we feel over Zoom. Cool. It speaks to that place so well that then the director, Scott Elliott said, hey man, this is so good. Like you guys should memorize this. Like what if we blocked it? Yeah. So it's, it's, and then, so I got a, you know, Derek McLean built a set and sent the set to my house. I had to build oh. it in my son's room. Oh, cool. And Tariq did the same thing. Wally did the same thing. And so it's, and then instead of it being like Zoom, like these cameras that we're using, it, we got some high end cameras. And gotcha. so, yes, it looks like a Zoom call, but it's well lit. We have mm. sets, we're in costume, the play is memorized. So it's, wow. it's not a, like a Zoom reading. It's imagine. Vladimir and Estergon, Estergon are in some kind of uh, bomb shelter is what it looks like. We're, we're like, we're Zooming each other during a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, we felt, I don't know if the audience will, but you know, uh, we felt the play became a new play. These sure. things that seemed intellectual on the page, people dying outside, not knowing mm -hmm. what day it is, not knowing what we're waiting for, or why we're even on this damn call. It, it, it was visceral in a way. I've always found the play incredible, but very intellectual. Yeah. And all of a sudden sure. it was funny and weird and it wasn't intellectual. It was Interesting. full of blood and, 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 and the stuff of life. Oh, I'm so excited to see it. Because oh, isn't Beckett, you like it. yeah, isn't all of Beckett supposed to be a response to World War II? Like it's all in yeah. the wake of yeah. trauma, and that so, trauma real trauma and so yeah. he, that part of it came alive for us you know he wrote it in the wake of all those refugees around europe after the war and the mass poverty and the mass displacement the anxiety the not knowing 
whether it was another world war, you know, there was war was happening like this, you know, and yeah. so that's a feeling I think we're a lot closer to, you know, we're, yes, this is the first time in my life I've really felt the fist of history, you know, <laughs> come slamming down like, whoa, shit, this, this life is not about all my, all my little problems back last February quickly yes. disappeared. Totally. I know you're also coming up. Also, there's a, you're entering the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's the Northman. There's more, more uh, Bloom productions. It seems like you're still quite busy. Yeah, I've managed to keep myself to this stuff. Yeah, I, I, uh, I did. All uh, while releasing John Brown and trying to get John Brown out of your system. Yeah, exactly. Well, the John Brown, I didn't work for a while there. It was, you know, I started the Northman in uh, the fall and and then we did the, because I'd been rehearsing the Beckett thing all summer. And then I, I did the Northman, which is Robert Eggers film. And yeah, I'm about to start working in the Marvel universe. They've made me sign 20,000 NDAs, you know, yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep myself busy for sure. That's great. Um, can I ask you some very backstagey, actorly questions? Definitely, man. That's what we're here to do, right? That's what we're here to do. That's what I'm. I should have asked you at the very beginning. Um, stuff like, how did you get your SAG card? I got my SAG card. Believe it or not, I um, I was 13, and I got cast. And they were doing these giant casting calls for a movie called The Explorers. Yeah. Which okay. In its day, was a big Hollywood movie, you know, for young actors and. I was just a kid from Jersey. I mean, I was living in Jersey and um, yeah. I, I went in and um, auditioned and, you know, I went on 17 auditions or whatever and I ended up getting the part and it was amazing. Ronald Reagan was president. He'd been the member of SAG and I went oh, in yeah. there and I, I got my SAG card. It was so exciting. How many auditions? That's insane for your first. Oh, I exaggerate. Role. I don't remember. I mean, how many. <laughs> it, it felt like 17. You know, when you're 13, I was like, what the hell? It was probably five or six. Sure. Well, that's the other thing, of course, we love to ask about is auditions. And I know, is it safe to say you're not auditioning as much anymore? Well, you know, I went through a period, probably 18 to 25, you know, until about after Reality Bites, my auditioning <laughs> life, um, dis every now and then I have to audition. There's some jerk director that <laughs> wants to make me sing and dance for my supper. Gotcha. Every, time, every time I audition now, it means they don't really want me. They've seen my work for the most part. So yeah. if they wanted me, they'd give me the part. Sure. Uh, I've, I've learned that the hard way. If I have to audition, it means they don't want you. Even. <laughs> um, and, uh, but no, auditioning was the most painful part of my life. And I really miss it. It's, it's a great, great opportunity to learn because awesome. through auditioning, you end up do, performing in parts outside of your comfort zone. Okay. Once you start making a name for yourself and not having to audition. If you don't audition, it means they want, they're casting you to do something you've already done. Yes. That's what happens. And so you stop, totally. you stop being able to push open the boundaries of what you're capable of doing. And yeah. you're just ending up playing into the way the world sees you. When That's I was younger, cool. for example, one of the best actors I've ever seen in my life is the actor Steve Zahn. And he's so funny that people love his wit and his humor and, and they'll constantly offering him parts to be funny. But when we were young together and doing a bunch of plays, I thought he was the next Gene Hackman. Mm. He just happens to be a really funny Gene Hackman. Mm. Um, but Gene Hackman was funny too, but he's because he's so successful in one area, it's very hard for him to get cast yeah. in, in, in parts that can use his full instrument, so to speak. And um, sure. And to, for all of us, that happens in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of the trade-off of, of becoming uh, a yeah. more well-known. Yeah. Um, do you have a worst audition horror story? So many. <laughs> I find it very painful. And, and um, I don't know about other actors, but no sooner do I start auditioning for something than I really want the part. Oh, okay. You, you know what I mean? Like when I start putting a lot of work into something, I want it. And a lot of times when you want a part, you push it further away. It's like an athlete trying too hard. Sure. You, you have to find that balance between caring and not caring. I had an audition. I, I remember I had to meet the director outside. He was coming from somewhere and he was going to take me inside. And I was so nervous and wound up for this damn mm -hmm. audition. 
that I kind of bounded down the steps to shake his hand and I slipped and I, oh. fell, and I fell hard down these stairs. Oh, and I ripped my pants and my knee was gushing blood. And, and he kept saying, I think you should go to the doctor. I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it's nothing. And it, meanwhile, blood's pouring down my leg. And I'm like, you ready to read? And, uh, Oh you know, or I'll tell you one more. I remember I was auditioning for River Runs Through It. Robert Redford was directing the movie. Uh-huh. And I wanted this part so bad. And I worked on this. The character had a monologue and I worked on it all night. I mean, sure. I couldn't sleep. I'd lay in bed running lines. I'd just get up and do it again. And I'd do it again. And I walked in to the audition room and Robert Redford was there. And he stuck out his hand. He said, hey, Ethan, I hear you're from Texas. And my brain went blank. Uh I was so starstruck. He had like his pistols from Butch and Sundance on the wall. (laughs) He had the poster from Downhill Racer uh, over his desk. You know, he had like the playing cards from The Sting. And Oh, my God. And the fact that he knew my name and where I was from, (laughs) I got like seasick or something. The room started spinning. Wow. And I said to him, I said, Mr. Redford, I, I think I think I'm starstruck. I think I think I know what this word means. And um, mm-hmm. is there any way I could go out and collect myself and come back in? Yeah. And he said, sure. Uh, go talk to Meredith or whoever was his secretary. Right. And I, I went out there and Meredith made a time for me to come back the next day. Oh, no. Oh. And I was like, I haven't slept. I just a whole other day of five minutes. I don't, I, I can't live through another 24 hours of trying to <laughs> if that being sad about it. And then, you know, needless to say, I didn't get the part. Needless to say, not every, yeah, not every time you meet your hero, are you able to then work with your hero? I guess. Yeah, that one didn't work out. <laughs> that's that, those are two, that's pure gold that we are going to, we are going to reuse those anecdotes for sure. This is a big one. Maybe this goes back to stuff you've recently been consuming. What is one performance you think every actor should see and why? I mean, you've mentioned several in the course of this interview. Well, I'd be lying if I didn't say, I think it's, we all have to hunt for the performances that speak to us. Sure. And um, there is a handful that permanently changed me. Um, You know, Denzel Washington and Glory and Malcolm (laughs) X you know, um, those two really, really blew me away. Paul Newman and Cool Hand Luke is yeah. a, it's a non if I've, I watched it again recently and it's entirely a nonverbal performance, basically. Mm. It's amazing what he communicates through body language. And let's see, um, you know, I just watched Gangs of New York. I mentioned that one earlier and yeah. I, I can't help, but Daniel Day-Lewis is just incredible in that movie. He's so deep and, and, and powerful. And, you know, I remember um, Sophie's Choice, Meryl Streep. Mm-hmm. You, you know, they, I'm not going to say anything that isn't on everybody else's top 10 sure. list. You know, I, I'm pressing my brain. Malkovich and True West changed my life. There's, there's, a, there's a handful of them out there. Uh, I would have to, Jack Nicholson and Red's. One Flew the Cuckoo's mm-hmm. Nest. Yeah. Warren Beatty, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, uh, mm-hmm. let's see. Uh, you know, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of silver bullet performances yeah. out there. Silver bullet. Yeah. That's what I call them. You know, like. Yeah. Basically, like, after you see Raging Bull, uh, the silver perfor- bullet performance to me always means uh, if they died after that performance, they still would be entered into the Hall of Fame, you know. Wow. It's like yeah. all you need, you know, is, yeah. is one silver bullet performance. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ethan. Uh, you've covered so much. Do you have, what is your, um, you know, one, what's the one piece of advice that you give to early career artists? Is there anything you wish you'd known? In general, I actually don't find advice really helps people. Sure, sure. You know, I think that the confidence is what we're all looking for. Mm. Confidence only comes with experience. It, it, confidence without experience is bravado, right? It's ego, is it? But uh, true confidence is rooted in experience. And confidence is fragile. Talent's not. But confidence mm. um, is fragile. And it can leave and come, you know. So for lack of a better thing to say, 
I'll say the really corny thing that makes everybody's skin crawl because it's so difficult to do and it's so obvious, which is love yourself. Mm. And that good things happen. You're a better friend. You're a better citizen. You're a better um, artist. You're a better lover if you if you treat yourself with respect. Yeah. And uh, it's it just starts there. And because if you can't do that, you start tripping over all that and you can't do anything else. Yeah. And so patience. That's great. Failure is good, right? All those things. But I, w- I wish I could just pick it up and not. In general, when people are giving advice, they're actually turning into a blowhard asshole. So I'll try not to give any more advice. <laughs> no, this is great. This uh, really, I think early career actors, writers, directors, and just humans can get a lot out of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for taking you time. And uh, keep breaking legs. I'll try, man. I'll try to keep singing the song, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see this documentary and all of your upcoming stuff. No, well, I There's appreciate so your many... time, man. You know, I really this appreciate so you taking time out of your life and I enjoyed this conversation. Me too. I'm going to think a lot about what are the real answers to these questions you have. About asked. the metaphors? Yeah. yeah. I, I have been dying, you know, for doing these podcast interviews for a year remotely. This is one that I really wish we could have done in person. That'd ah, be so fun. <laughs> but uh one, but one day some days in the future we will and now it's time to hear from christine mckenna torella our backstage casting insider i will let her take it away hi guys christine mckenna torella here Ethan Hawke has a lot of gems about character creation and audition preparation in this episode. Very thoughtful actor in the way he creates characters in particular. And also I thought this was super clear to me that he is a big thespian and a lover, a big geek about theater. And this week I thought that was a nice segue and I would keep it short and sweet because there is a lot to celebrate. Broadway has official dates for coming back. And a few weeks ago, I chatted about the state of the industry and the fact that the UK already has set dates for kind of late spring, early summer for the West End returning, and that Australia already was open in Sydney and other places for theatre. So now we can add New York to that list. So in case you don't know the official dates, I want to tell you. So New York will be able to have full capacity from July 1st. So some venues are opening at that point, especially off-Broadway. But the official return of kind of Broadway shows seems to be September onwards. Not everything has announced yet, but this is what we know so far. So six Chicago, Come From Away. Those are some shows that are opening mid-September, kind of that September 14, around that time. Mrs. Doubtfire and Phantom of the Opera are returning mid-October. And some shows like Company and Harry Potter are still waiting a little longer with official opening dates of December for Company and early 2022 for Harry Potter. Still waiting on some of the other shows to announce their return dates, but I think this is such a great start. There are still very important conversations about equity, inclusion, and change in the decisions that get made in the commercial theater process, and I want to see those changes, and I'm excited to see the progress that people have made so far. I want us to build back stronger. It has been a very, very difficult year for the creatives that I know in New York, the artists the um, actors, the directors, and casting. And for this moment, I feel such relief and joy that the great bright way is finally returning. On to the casting calls for this week. Bomba Socks are casting five actors, wide ranging types of talent, including trans actors, mature actors, differently abled, and plus size actors and models for an amazing shoot for their brand. I didn't know this about Bombas, but it has, it has it in the casting call, so I thought I'd read it out. An amazing um, sock brand donates one pair of socks to someone who's affected by homelessness for each pair of socks that is purchased. It makes me want to go out and buy them. Shooting in New York, and the buyer, it's pretty good. It's $1,000. Check that out if you're in that area. If you're in Texas, they are seeking people with improv comedy experience to play characters discussing their weight loss journeys. It is for a commercial for a confidential 
Weight Management Company. Check that out if you're in Texas. And in LA, there is a digital commercial for Sling TV, and they're casting from demo reels and media clips, uh, particularly looking for comedy or commercial pieces for your demo reels to attach. So uh, attach that with your headshot and resume. It has to be for LA actors. The second round, they're asking for self tapes. It's going to be a completely remote shoot. I love to see it. As always, there are literally hundreds of castings that are current and live on this site for every type of actor from every region. So check those out and the ones that I read today. That's all from me. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.